one of the struggles that the church faces today is to distinguish between what is desired as felt needs and what is required in order to meet what the Bible, what God says are true needs. Now, it's wrong to make them an either-or, as though if you're fulfilling one, you certainly can't possibly ever be fulfilling the other. But the modern church has gone way far afield from the Bible in all of this. Sometimes we are focused on scratching people where they itch, rather than giving people what they truly need. What does it mean to meet the needs of God's people? What does it mean to meet the needs of a church? As we come to the book of Titus, Titus is going to help us think through what this means. It's going to help us think through what is essential, vital for the life and, and longevity of the church. Now, let's begin by just taking a brief look at the book itself. Let's think about the context in which the book is written. When we talk about the Bible, we talk about several layers and spheres of context. There is the, the context in the world. What is going on around the author and the people to whom it is written? Then there's the context of the book itself. When does... When does this exist in biblical history? What's going on alongside of it? How did we lead up to it? How does the rest of the Bible understand it? And so we find Titus and its place in the New Testament. Paul wrote to Titus around 63-64 AD. By this time, Paul had written all of what we think of as his doctrinal epistles. The New Covenant faith had been clearly taught. It was very clear that Paul thought of the faith as existing among the churches. And the book reflects this fullness as both Titus and Timothy are sent to serve and to preach in the churches. Well, then think about its situation in the culture of the day. The book was written to someone, to Titus, who was responsible to make sure that the churches were established. Crete was a Roman colony at the time. It had been the home island of the Minoan civilization. During the time when Israel was in Egypt, the Philistines had migrated to the land of Canaan from Crete the relatively small island with a mountain range running almost down through its center like a spine. Most of the major towns of Titus's day would have been along the northeast coast. It was a very decadent culture, renowned for its debauchery and its drunkenness. But notice its significance for the life of the church. Paul left Titus in Crete to complete what he had left undone. The new churches there needed to be established. This meant, both in truth and leadership and structure and the Christian life. In instructing Titus, Paul keyed in on the essentials of biblical ministry. What then would we think of as the central theme of the book? What occurs over and over again is the word truth, doctrine, what God's people, the elect, the chosen are to believe. But then what occurs over and over again are words like good works. Here are duty, how the truth is to live. So the church must know how the faith, doctrine, is to work itself out in the life and community of the church. What one believes does produce works. 
But true Bible works, spiritual works, are produced by the commands and exhortations in the scriptures. The book often calls the church to all different kinds of good works, appropriate for genuine and true faith. And here in this book, we find several times that Paul will say that the truth, the gospel, is promised, it's revealed, it's proclaimed, it's believed, it is lived. This is, in fact, the trajectory of redemptive history. It reminds us how our own personal story fits into the big story, the great story. And there can be no such thing as Christianity without truth or without doctrine. To be a Christian, one must believe the truth. To be a church, one must affirm the truth. To be an elder pastor, one must live and proclaim the truth. To be disciples, one must live the truth and share it with others. To see it another way, truth flows from the nature and character of God into the Word. The truth enters and drives the life of those who believe, and those who believe translate the truth into living. Those who by grace have met the qualifications and are set aside as elders are to teach the truth. Truth helps us to know who is teaching what is not the truth and to silence them. Truth is what grace teaches in the language of living. The truth unites while dividing and distinguishing those who would lead others astray into heresy. And finally, truth will express itself in personal care for one another. And we find in the Bible that generally truth is a singular noun. We sometimes speak of the truths of the Word of God, and that's, that's okay to understand when we're thinking about you know, statements of truth one right after the other. But the Bible, in a pluralistic world, we as believers should not be talking about truths as though what we believe is one truth and what a false religion believes is another truth and what... New Age mythologies teach us as though these were separate truths on the trail. That's what the world believes. So we should be careful. We can say among ourselves the truths of the word of God, but we should never say the truths in the world. There's only one truth. It's singular. The truth of the word of God and how the word interprets the world. There are no Hindu, Muslim, New Age or frankly, even science, truths with a capital T, these are not on equal footing. They may have pieces of the truth, but it is borrowed or possibly even stolen from the truth. All truth has been created and revealed and interpreted by God, and there is no such thing as truth, which in fact contradicts what the Bible says. Now, many, this may come as a shock to many of you. Many of you are no, young enough to have grown up with the ideas of narrative and story. A narrative is your truth. It's one's truth. A narrative is a story that is intended to be accepted as truth, to be believed and acted on. Why is this important? In the ages through which the Bible was given, there were many equal and competing truths. These were equal and competing worldviews, often hiding behind the masks of religion. But they were myths. They were the narratives of gods and goddesses, of earth and fire and water and air, of spirits inhabiting all things, or all things being self-aware. And we are used to thinking of science as, a, as, as truth. Be careful. It may be true in some aspects, but a great deal of modern sciences are probably not even accurate explanations of reality of all that God made and all that God revealed. 
And so this book is significant because it's highlighting of truth and truth to be lived. But let's think for a moment about the author. This letter is written to a person, and it follows the standard form of letter writing of its day. Letters were written on scrolls, and therefore, the very first thing that you would find in an epistle or a letter of written during the New Testament day is the identity of the sender and the identity of the recipient. And so, in your Bibles to Titus chapter 1, looking at verses 1 to 3, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began, and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God, our Savior. Well, certainly, Paul opens by identifying himself. And because the way he identifies himself varies from letter to letter, it's useful to look carefully and see if there might be some intentionality to his self-description. First, he is a servant of God. This word could also mean a bondservant, or possibly even a voluntary slave. Paul places this first. He takes a humble place before God. He takes a humble place before the church. He is first and foremost a servant of God. But this also means that God is his master. What he writes, the truths that he teaches, the commands that he gives are not merely his own words at his own direction. They're coming from someone who is saying and doing what his master requires. But then here, Paul speaks of his purpose. He often refers to his purpose and life and ministry. Sometimes he does so directly. He says to Timothy, you knew my, my example and my purpose and my ministry and my sacrifice. But most often it is like, it is in this sentence here. Paul, for the fa sake of the faith of God's elect. This is a, this is a purpose statement. This is, a, this is the trajectory of my life statement. For the sake of the faith of God's elect, their knowledge of the truth, which accords or aligns itself with godliness. Now, Paul's life and ministry are centered around the faith, the truth that God's chosen people need. It is for the sake of the truth, and it is for the sake of people to Paul. Truth and people matter. And Paul is concerned that God's chosen people know the truth. More will be said about this, but Paul is not merely concerned that the faith, the body of doctrine the church is, is to hold or is compiled. One of the purposes of his life is to communicate that to others. Seems to me this mitigates against the idea of theological study groups whose sole purpose is to ponder truth but never to preach the truths pondered. For Paul, he lived both to ponder and to proclaim. And Paul also seems to highlight truth that relates to life. It is truth that accords with godliness. Now, this is not a limiter, as though Paul is only concerned with truth that has personal or practical application. Rather, it's just the opposite. Paul is making an assertion that all truth relates to godliness. There is a connection between every facet of God's revealed truth and the life a believer is to live. But then we see here a third aspect of Paul, and that is his passion. 
Paul's passion is a gospel passion. But it is an all-encompassing gospel. Listen to what he says. In hope of eternal life, which God who never lies, promised before the ages began, and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been trusted by the command of God our Savior. Paul's hope in the future, his eschatological assurance, is a huge passion in his life and ministry. He often speaks of the coming of Christ at his coming to be blameless, the glory that will be revealed. He thought and pondered about it a lot. It was a huge passion in his life. But eternal life is not merely heaven. In the New Testament, eternal life is the life of God through the Spirit, which becomes our present possession through regeneration. Now, the life of God in our souls is eternal. It connects to God and to His dwelling place. It connects us to one another and to all believers. It is the presence of the future. New creation in the present old world. And it will reach its final fulfillment in the new heavens and new earth. Each phrase in this sentence is rich with hope, raising, passion, feeling, filling, truth. First, our hope is in the promises of a God who never lies. The surety of our salvation, our life eternal, is a present and future possession, is guaranteed by the very character of God. He has never lied. He is the God of truth. His promises will never, ever fail. And God's promise of eternal life for his elect is not new. It has been his plan from before time began. Before anything was created, God purposed and planned and provided for what he had committed to do. And what God had purposed and promised, he has revealed. It was revealed in many ways through many people until the Lord came. But even then, it was not until Paul began to unfold the multifaceted certainties of God's great jewel of salvation that we would see all of its stunning reality. It was always there in God's Word. It was always there in the Old Testament. But Paul's understanding of it and his preaching of it opened it up so that the mysteries were now clear. What Paul is teaching and preaching is not his own agenda nor his personal perspectives. The body of truth he has delivered in his preaching and writing was entrusted to him by God. This makes the truth, according to Paul, not negotiable. God entrusted the new covenant interpretation of the Old Testament and the doing and dying of Jesus to Paul. Yes, the writers of the New Testament, I'm sorry, the other writers of the New Testament are giving truth as well. But at the core of the new covenant is what God had entrusted to Paul and he delivered through his life. This is what Titus must teach. This is what the church must believe. And frankly, this is what the rest of the New Testament must and does conform to. And so we have the book and we have its author, but then we have his partner. Verse 4, to Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. Now Titus was from Antioch in Syria. He was a Syrian Antioch and was one of Paul's converts. He was sent to Corinth to report to Paul on the effect that his first letter to them had had. He met Paul in Macedonia and then was left at Crete to organize the churches there. Titus had great responsibilities in several difficult situations. Now, who is Titus, particularly in relation to Paul? We don't know much about Titus outside of his relation with Paul, but he is referred to many times in Paul's writing. 
First, he was a fellow worker in the ministry. Paul considered Titus to be a partner, a fellow worker. He had discipled Titus and had taken him to various churches. 2 Corinthians 8.23 As for Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker among you. As for our brothers, they are representatives of the church and they are an honor to Christ. 2 Corinthians 12.18 I urged Titus to go to you and I sent our brother with him. Titus did not exploit you, did he? Did we not act in the same spirit and follow the same course? Titus was also a great encouragement to Paul. He was an encouragement to Paul when the tide or opposition or heaviness of struggling churches weighed on Paul's heart. In 2 Corinthians 2.13, Paul writes, I still had no peace of mind because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I said goodbye to them and went on to Macedonia. 2 Corinthians 7, 6. The God who comforts the downcast comforted us by the coming of Titus. 2 Corinthians 7, 13. By all this we are encouraged. In addition to our own encouragement, we were especially delighted to see how happy Titus was because his spirit had been refreshed by you all. Titus was a motivator to further ministry. Since Titus had been an encouragement to Paul, he was sent to exercise the gifts of encouragement with others. He was to teach and train and correct. But he was also to motivate people to greater acts and works of service to God and to one another. For example, in 2 Corinthians 7.14, I had boasted about him, speaking of Titus, about it. I had boasted to him about you, and you have not embarrassed me, but just as everything we said to you was true, so our boasting about you to Titus has proved to be true as well. 2 Corinthians 8, 6. So we urge Titus, since he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. 2 Corinthians 8, 16. I thank God who put into the heart of Titus this same concern that I have for you. And Titus was a valued assistant in the struggles of the ministry. Paul had many people who served around him. But two men stand out as having a special relationship with Paul. This is reflected in Galatians 2.1. Fourteen years later, Paul wrote, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along also. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised even though he was a Greek. 2 Timothy 4.10, For Demas because he has loved this world, has deserted me, and has gone to Thessalonica. Cretans has gone to Galatia, and Titus to Dalmatia. I want you to briefly consider a comparison and contrast between Titus and Timothy. I've created a little chart here, if we can pull that up. Um, both were written to and both had survived Paul. It's interesting, both Titus and Timothy continued on in life and ministry after Paul had been martyred. Both were sent on difficult and delicate missions. And so Titus had been sent to Crete. He had been, uh, Timothy had been sent to Ephesus. Ephesus was a difficult place when Timothy went. Titus was a pure Gentile. Timothy was half Jew and half Greek. Titus is never associated with Paul in any of his opening salutations. To me, that is interesting. Associate, but Timothy is associated with Paul in several opening salutations. Paul, the servant of God, and Titus, my fellow worker, my partner, and so on. I mean, Timothy. But that never happens with Titus. Titus is never mentioned in the book of Acts. Now think about that for a minute. Timothy is very prominent in the book of Acts. Titus seems to have had a strong and aggressive personality. We derive that from the book itself and from some warnings and cautions that Paul gave to Titus. 
Timothy seems to have been nervous and maybe had a shy, more retiring disposition. Titus is commended for his endurance. Well, it seems from some of the things that Paul says to Timothy that he struggled with health problems. Two servants serving along with Paul, very different in their personalities, their makeups, possibly even their gifts. These two sons in the faith served the church well as they served with and they served under Paul. And he is the recipient of a common blessing. From Paul to Titus, enabling grace and calming peace. Now, this was a common greeting and blessing, yet it is loaded with special meaning for Titus. In the task he has been given to do, what greater need does he have than a grace that enables his work and a peace that calms his heart? In a day where ministry is being defined in terms of felt needs, the emphasis of Titus is deeply needed. And the focus is on the relationship between doctrine and living. It often it answers the question that is often asked today. How does truth relate to my life? Now, Paul speaks to the issue of truth in terms of giving heed to a series of commands. These commands shape how Titus and the churches in Crete are going to live out the body of truth that Paul has taught and Titus will give. Now, these commands are not distinct from the truth. They themselves are a part of truth. They are a kind of the truth. We make a false distinction when we say truth and commands as though we are talking about two different things. Truth involves principles and statements of truth, but truth also involves commands and statements of precepts. Commands are truth. Commands believed are obeyed. So just briefly, what are the, these commands that we find through the book of Titus? Chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, he is to preach the word. The truth must be proclaimed. There's no room for compromise. Corporate and eldership obedience is required whether people feel it, feel they need it or not. Ordain godly elders, chapter 1, verses 5 to 9. The truth must be established in the standards for church elders. They must be people who have translated the Bible into the language of living. Chapter 1, verses 10 through 16. The imperative is to silence false teachers. The truth may be such a priority that within a gathered church setting, false teaching is not to be tolerated. It must be silenced. This is totally contra our PC culture. It's a clear imperative. For the New Testament views the spread of error as being deadly to the life of the church. In chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, the imperative is to disciple the congregation. The truth must be communicated in practical terms by personal example and discipleship. Discipleship is not merely a way of doing ministry in the church. Functionally, a church without discipleship is a disobeying the commission God gave us. In chapter 2, verses 3, 11 through 14, the imperative is to live by grace. The truth enables and informs grace living. True grace molds truth into holy living. Demanding truth and obedience is not legalism. It is in fact grace. Grace is not here to set us free to sin, but to set us free from sin. Chapter 2, verse 15, the imperative is to confront with authority. The truth gives authority to the elders. Their authority is in terms of the truth. In fact, without a common body of belief in a gathered church, there can actually be no authority. Chapter 3, verses 1 to 7, the imperative is to confront with, uh, I'm sorry, is to maintain a godly witness. 
The truth is also lived out in our relationships to those who are not believers, to sinners. The truth must be exhibited so that it can be explained. Chapter 3, verses 8 through 11, the imperative is to reject divisive people. The truth is a unifying factor. Doctrinal unity is such a priority that people who lead factions are to be rejected after a process of loving confrontation with truth so as to bring about change and reconciliation. Chapter 3, verses 12 through 15, the final imperative is to meet pressing needs. Truth bears fruit in meeting the needs of others. And so this truth exhorts us to care and to have compassion for one another. Well, a lot to think about here. Let me, in closing, just highlight some things. First, the ministry is truth-oriented. It proclaims the word to bring the elect to the belief of the truth so that they live it out. Because God's character is truth. And we observe here that election and eternal life are rooted in the character of God. After all, God made the promise to somebody. We stand amazed at the love and grace of God who promised in eternity past that his chosen people would be righteous in daily life because he would give them his word. And there is a great glory in preaching We today have a tendency to slight its importance and value in the church. Let us remember it has been given to us as part of God's strategic planning. Preaching of doctrine, therefore, is not an option. It is a command. It is, in fact, what we must do. And true union comes when there is a shared faith. The church gathers around its shared belief. Those who are not in agreement must remain teachable and not lead others astray. And we can bask in the blessing of our Heavenly Father and Jesus our Savior in our foul and frenetic world. We need sanctifying grace and calming peace. You see, there is much confusion about the necessity of doctrine and truth in today's society and in today's church. All people believe that truth matters. The real difference is in whether what they believe is actually true. And yes, we find that doctrine divides. It separates us from unbelievers, from sin, from error, from false teachers and from people who lead factions. And doctrine unites. It unites us to Christ, to grace, to a gathered church, to godly leadership, to holiness, and to meeting needs. These are the true needs of the church. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these opening paragraph of a relatively small book. And yet so, so rich in truth for us and help for us and challenge to our thinking in this modern world as it was a challenge to the thinking of the people who had believed in Crete. And may us, as we work through this book, may it transform our lives and give us, cause us to hold fast to truth and that we would take the truth and translate it into the life that we live. We ask this for the glory of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.